singing out again together. Uh, We're in Habakkuk chapter 1 still. If uh, you have a Bible, you can open that up, Habakkuk chapter 1. Uh, We'll be looking at verses 12 through uh, chapter 2, verse 1 uh, this morning. I'll I'll read those here shortly. Uh, Chapter 1, verses 12 through chapter 2, verse 1. Um, I was looking at the text this week and, and wrestling with all the, the, the chaos of our society and everything that's going on, just wondering uh, what to say, how to speak into this. Um, and conveniently, uh, the, the text for this morning is Habakkuk protesting. So um, I tried to come up with some examples of protesting, but I don't know, like, no, there's, there's plenty, right? Uh, we're surrounded by protesting right now and just uh, people um, who are hurt, people who don't know how to engage this issue. Um, there's, you know, anger and fear and uncertainty and all these different emotions just uh, bubbling over. So today, um, in, a, in a timely manner, by uh, God's design, uh, we'll get a, to look at how Habakkuk protests about uh, an apparent injustice. Remember, uh, he started out by asking God, he's saying, God, how long do I need to wait? Uh, how long are you going to wait? How long are you idly going to sit by and just watch all of this evil unfold before your eyes? Like he knows God could stop this in an instant, but God is not doing that. So uh, here, here we have Habakkuk uh, really going to the Lord, asking some really tough questions. Last week, we looked at God's response. He says, well, Habakkuk, uh, I am doing a work in your days that if told you would not believe. Uh, I'm raising up that hasty and wicked nation, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. Uh, He talked about how uh, they're fierce, right? Uh, They're prideful. They're not easily satisfied. They're like the wind. They, they'll consume you and just go on to the next victim. Um, and, and, and he's raising them up. So here we have Habakkuk going back to the Lord with his protest. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and hopefully learn a thing or two just about how we can participate in an environment of protest. Um, how, how do we engage that, right? What do we say? How, how do we approach God? How do we approach other people? And I think Habakkuk shows us some things here uh, that can be really helpful for us as, as we think about this. And it, it's important to see, you know, the very first verse uh, of Habakkuk, it says that this is an oracle of Habakkuk. Your uh, uh, version may say it's a, a, a prophecy of Habakkuk or a burden of Habakkuk. Like this, this entire book was given to Habakkuk uh, by God. The conversation that's happening here here, whether it's in question form or uh, prophetic form, uh, Habakkuk speaking something, this was designed by God. And it's interesting, there's, there's in the rest of Scripture and, and the rest of literature outside of the Bible, there's very little information about Habakkuk. Like, he's just this guy that God dropped in, um, and, and we have his testimony, his example preserved for all of time, really, uh, in a pretty powerful way. And I, I think one thing it models is how to approach God in hard times in a way that, that God's okay with. He, he's all right with this. So it's not to say Habakkuk does everything perfectly, um, but it's a good model for us uh, to, to follow after. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, one of the first things you can observe from this text as you read through it is that prayer should be a part of, of this, right? Uh, that's not something that he talks about. He doesn't talk about prayer too much, uh, but he models it Uh, This whole thing is in the context of prayer. He's going to God asking questions. He's making statements. That's what prayer is, being in conversation, being in relationship with God. So that's where I want to start this morning uh, as we do every week. Uh, So I want to invite you uh, just to pray with me as we prepare to read God's Word and just invite Him into this. Uh, Would you pray with me? Father God, again, we just come before you now, and uh, we do invite you uh, to work in our hearts and minds in in ways that only you can. God, we need uh, wisdom from you and knowledge from you and insight from you in in these difficult days when, uh, you know, it's it's hard to know uh, where to speak um, and how to speak. Uh, So God, we're we're praying that you would be at work this morning in your church around the world um, in the hearts of people who are seeking after you, and Lord, we do uh, we believe that your word is true, so we just pray that uh, it would be shaping us into the people that you want us to be, and uh, just lead us through this time together. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, I'm going to read through this, chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 2, verse 1, if you'd like to follow along. 
So remember, this is Habakkuk responding to God here, his second complaint. He says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. And uh, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man that's more righteous than he is? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook and he drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net, and he makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So here we see uh, Habakkuk not too thrilled with God's response, right? There's, there's still some disconnect. There's some things that, that still don't make sense in his mind. So he's going back to the Lord and just talking more about the enemy here and, and how wicked they really are and how they've become like the fish of the sea. Like they, they have no ability to determine what they're going to do. They're just at the mercy of this uh, evil enemy, and he's concerned about that. He's, Lord, you know, he's basically saying, how can you possibly let these bad people endlessly destroy good people? Um, shouldn't you come and rescue the victim? Isn't this enough? This isn't fair. It's not right. Something has to give, right? Uh, people leave the faith all the time for stuff like this. We talked about that last week. We shared an example of that last week. Somebody leaving the faith because uh, what is unfolding under, before their eyes doesn't seem to make sense with what they understand about God. There's a disconnect there. But Habakkuk shows us that we don't have to leave. We can wrestle. We can wrestle with God. We can bring these difficult questions and hard issues before God and engage with Him in relationship, in uh, conversation. So let's look at a few things here, see what we might learn uh, about engaging God and about a, a, a heart that's really protesting what is happening uh, before Him. So the first thing I want to talk about, uh, point one, we should protest apparent injustices. We should protest apparent injustices. You might ask, well, why did I say apparent? Um, I said apparent because I think uh, sometimes we can believe that, that we are absolutely without question on the right side of the argument. And we know how things should be. And, and we're going into that conversation determined. And our mind is already made up. I'm, I don't need to change my mind. I don't need to hear anything else because I understand and this is how it is, right? We can go with that uh, attitude, but I think we have to leave the door open to the possibility that, that maybe we are wrong. We don't like to do that, right? Uh, but it's a possibility. Maybe we have understood uh, what's happening in a wrong way. Maybe we don't have all of the information. We certainly don't have all the information that God has. So especially as we go to the Lord with... Uh, protest or with question or with uncertainty. We have to leave open a window of opportunity that says, you know what? Uh, I may have missed the mark. I, I'm off on this. Um, so there's times that, as I mentioned, we can enter into a, a conversation with absolute certainty that we are right. And I think there are cases when, when that's true, right? Uh, Murder, abuse, oppression, violence, like, like those things are wrong. The Bible tells us that. But even as we approach the conversation uh, in those areas that we know we're probably right, uh, we have to have a posture that, that shows we're here for conversation. Because the posture with which we approach the table of conversation has the ability to determine how much progress is going to be made. Right? We're going to talk more about that. The posture with which we approach the table has the, the ability to determine how much posture is going to be made uh, or how much progress is going to be made. Excuse me. It's, you know, if, if you go marching in, I know the way it is. I don't need to listen. Uh, that presents a, a completely different attitude than if we uh, go and are, are ready to listen as well. Um, you know, the, the temptation is just to, to sit it out. Right, to let the issues unfold and, and to watch from the sidelines and just say, you know what, I've had enough of this. 
And I've had that temptation over the last couple of weeks. It's like, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to engage in this. So I, I'm just going to turn the TV off. I'm going to disconnect from social media. I'm just going to shut it off because I don't know how to engage. I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and watch this one unfold and see what happens. That, that's a temptation that I hear many people share, right? And I think it's reasonable because we don't know how to fit into that. But then I'll come across scripture, uh, one I came across this week, actually, Psalm 82, verse 3. It says, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. And I think, you know, that's the heart of God, defending the weak, defending the fatherless, standing for the oppressed and the poor. And and that means... uh, we got to get back in the game, right? If we've been on the sidelines, those scriptures nudge us and say, hey, look, somebody has to advocate for these people. Somebody has to advocate for these issues. So yes, I believe God does want us to protest apparent injustices. Um, And and where do we see this in Habakkuk? Uh, Let's get this rooted in the text here. Um, Protest here is, is similar to what I said about prayer. He doesn't talk a lot about prayer, but he's praying throughout this whole thing. It's a conversation. The same with his protest here. He's not talking about going to the Lord, but he's showing us, he's modeling that he's going to the Lord. Uh, it's by uh, observing what he does here. And, and he really lays out uh, the, his observations really clearly, which is a good uh, thing to learn about protesting as well. It's articulated clearly. You can understand who's involved and what the issues are. Uh, So so how does Habakkuk lay this out? First, he identifies uh, the people involved, God, uh, and he talks about God, the everlasting one, right? The holy one. He says, you are my God, you are my Lord, you are my rock. So he's talking about God. God would be in the position of uh, kind of the judge or the mediator, right? Uh, for, For my family, if we're thinking about my kids, that's me and my wife. If my kids want to protest, they come to me or they come to my wife because we are the ones who can institute change. We are the ones who get to set the rules. We get to set the boundaries. We get to determine who's in the right and who's in the wrong. So they come to us. Now, all of you, that could be anybody given your uh, situation that may come to mind. Who are you protesting to? It might be to God about some things that are real hard in life right now. It might be a spouse. It might be your child. It could be a coworker, a boss. It could be anybody. But there, there's almost always three parties involved when a protest is taking place. Uh, Habakkuk identifies them clearly. The first is God. He's the one who has the ability to institute change, right? He talks about that. God, you're sitting here watching this, so I'm coming to you because I want to see some change. Uh, the other one are the bad guys, right? The Babylonians. He talks a lot about the Babylonians uh, and, and how wicked they are. Uh, they're like fishermen who are just reeling in fish and throwing them to the side and they cast out their net and they get some more and they're just killing people mercilessly, right? They're, they're uh, a wicked people uh, that have no good in them, apparently. Uh, so Habakkuk lays that out and, and then he lays out the good guys, his group, right? God's people, the people he thinks God is for, Uh, The people who shouldn't be getting treated so terribly, right? They're righteous is what he calls them in the text. So you got the bad guys, the good guys, and the judge. Kind of this triangle of people involved. That's usually how it plays out in a protest. Habakkuk identifies all of that. And, And what's the injustice that he identifies? Well, basically he's saying there are evil people destroying good people in the front of this in the front of the eyes of this judge who has the ability to stop it, but the judge isn't stopping it. That's a problem. Why are the evil guys winning when it could be stopped right now? That's the injustice he sees. The, the bad guys should not be winning. Why is this going on? So he's going to the Lord. Um, you know, that's not fair. Um, if you see or experience apparent injustice, we have to know we're allowed to bring that to the Lord. Habakkuk models that here. Uh, There's a really good statement I read this week, uh, probably the one that I'll remember most from just uh, preparation and sharing this morning. Uh, If you're a note taker, it's a good one to jot down. This is uh, by a commentator, Palmer Robertson, Uh, no relation to the Robertson family of Duck Dynasty, but uh, yeah, just coincidence, I think. Um, So Palmer says this, he says, uh, speaking about Habakkuk, This isn't an expression of weak faith by Habakkuk. It's perplexed faith. This isn't weak faith. 
It's perplexed faith. I think that's really important to notice. Um, that's good information. Habakkuk actually shows time and time again that, that he's a man of faith. He knows God. He loves God, uh, but he's really confused right now. And, and he's got some things that need to be figured out. The lines are getting crossed. He's confused. It's not making sense. He's perplexed. And he has the confidence. In fact, his relationship is so good with God. It's so strong that he knows he can go to God and ask those hard questions. So here he is in front of God asking some hard things. This is a guy who's a prophet, and he appears to have the confidence to go and ask some really good questions. Um, So what does that mean for all of us? I think it means that we need to be a family that has people who are mature in faith, just like I think Habakkuk is, who are willing to ask hard questions, who are willing to wrestle with difficult things. It's not, a, it's not a, an example of weak faith. It's just saying, hey, look, uh, I don't understand what's going on. And it's okay to say, I don't understand what's going on in the grand scheme of things. Because God is operating at a completely different level than we are. And actually, our ability to understand and grow is going to happen in a context of, of being able to ask some questions and able to ask uh, hard questions and have conversation with people. And I know uh, just over the past few years, uh, of being here uh, as a part of Faith Alliance Church. So some of you have went through some really hard things. Uh, we've had people endure hardship that definitely sends me home. And as I drive home, I think, that one's not fair. Why does that happen, Lord? That was a good person. That was just a child. They, they didn't deserve that. Why right now? That sickness for that person? You know, it's, and some of you, you're dealing with this intimately. You know it in your personal life. You know it in your relatives. You know it in your friends. Uh, There's some hard things that have happened here. And surely we have to be able to ask God, why is this happening? We can't silence people who want to say, what's going on here? How does this make any sense? Uh, We have to to be willing to, to bring those to the Lord and say, I don't see how this is fair. Can you, can you teach me? Because Habakkuk does go and listen, right? It's not him saying how it should be. He's going there uh, with an ability to listen. It's not weak faith. It's perplexed faith. And he wants to understand. He wants to, to gain some knowledge. Um, and, and don't let me dismiss anyone who feels you might have weak faith, as if you know, perplexed faith is okay, but weak faith is just uh, can't have anything to do with that. Jude chapter 1 says that we should be merciful to those who doubt. Um, so uh, at the same time, it's not settling in a place of, of doubt or uncertainty or questioning God. We don't want to build up uh, or, or celebrate the idea that, that we can just question God and everything he's doing. But as I said a couple weeks ago, if that's where you find yourself, it's okay to be there as you strive for more understanding and more uh, knowledge of what God wants for you. Um, so if we have uh, things that we think are not right. They're not fair. We can bring those to God. We see Habakkuk model that. Our our second point this morning kind of informs the first one. Uh, When we protest, it should be done in humility and with respect. When we protest, it should be done in humility and with respect. Uh, This may actually be the, the greater indicator of maturity, not whether or not we protest, but how we go about protesting, right? Again, uh, you might think of, of your children. That's what my mind goes to because that's where I see the most protesting. And, and uh, as, as they grow and mature, as they get older, uh, the way they protest has changed, right? When they're, when they're two, there's a lot of screaming and crying and tears and just they don't know how to process that. They don't know how to communicate things as well, right? But now our, our oldest two are eight and nine. Our youngest is four, so she's kind of a tweener. But uh, once they get to eight and nine, and I'm sure those of you who have had kids who are older, you get to see a more structured uh, protest, right? And it, it does come with a little sense of respect. They, they know that me and my wife 
get to a, get a decide who's in the right and who's in the wrong and what the consequences are going to be. Uh, so they come with some respect and they, they really lay out the argument a little bit better. Uh, those of you who have teenagers, you're probably thinking, hey, that's not going to continue to grow and mature. Like it gets pretty crazy again. Um, and I imagine it does. I haven't been there, but you know, we all hope and pray that as our kids grow and mature, that they can learn how to, to engage in protest in ways that are respectful and done with a sense of humility. Uh, and, and that's what we uh, should be modeling for them as well. Um, Habakkuk, I think he models this. I, I want to show it in the text. Uh, how, how does he model humility and, and respect? Uh, first, he acknowledges who God is, right? Right? He doesn't go in there uh, ready to just attack God and tell God how it is. He's not, he's not in there just running the show. And I think whether we're approaching God or we're approaching other people, that's the attitude we go to the table with. Uh, it's not, we're not in there uh, just saying how things are, are, are going to be. Uh, he says, Lord, you are from everlasting. You are God. He says, you are my God. You are my holy one. So you see how personal this is for Habakkuk? I think that's important too. Like this is an, a personal interaction that he's having. He's saying, you are my God. You are my holy one. Like I have loved you. I have lived for you. I have honored you with my life. You have been my God. How are you allowing this to happen to me? Two people who care about each other deeply and He's trying to wrestle through this. He doesn't understand how God, who loves him so much, and he loves God so much, how is this happening? And all of us have experienced that at some point in our life. When people who are close to you uh, do something that you think is wrong or hurtful, it stings a little more. Like, how, how can this happen? You're the person I love. You're the person I trust. And we see Habakkuk playing that out right here. Uh, but he does it with respect. He's acknowledging who God is. Uh, he's hurting. He's feeling alone. He's feeling isolated. You can see the first phases of grief, uh, first phase of grief, denial and isolation. They're playing out right here in Habakkuk's life pretty clearly. He's feeling alone. He wants God's help through this. Uh, but despite his hurt and confusion, uh, he doesn't march up to God and start uh, pointing his finger or, or saying how things need to be. Uh, earlier I had said, the posture with which we approach the table has the ability to determine whether or not progress will be made. I think that uh, connects to the idea of humility and respect uh, really powerfully. If we go to the table of conversation, no matter who it's with, whether it's with God or it's with others, if we go with a posture of humility and respect, it's going to do great things uh, for the ability to make some progress, because it shows people, hey, I'm here to listen, I'm here to have some dialogue, I'm here to express myself, but I'm also, I recognize who you are, you're a person created by God, you have value, uh, I'm not better than you, and we see Habakkuk showing that, he recognizes his place here, uh, he goes with humility and respect, and, and I think this is a big one in our current situation, right? You, you look at how protest is taking place. And there's nothing wrong with protesting. We've talked about that. People who are being oppressed, the weak, the fatherless, the poor, people need advocates. People need people to come alongside of them. Protesting can be healthy. Uh, but if respect and humility are thrown out the window, then it's just going to be chaos. And it's just pride and power grabs. People trying to step over the other. Uh, so you might ask, what is your concern this morning? What are you protesting? Is there some injustice in your life, whether it's in your personal life or in society? How do you approach that with a sense of humility and respect? No matter what the issue is, no matter who's right and who's wrong or who you think is right or who you think is wrong, how do we step into that environment with humility and respect and show the hate? Well, I'm not here to just run the show and say it's my way or the highway. I'm here for conversation and to make progress. And I think that's a point of invitation this morning is uh, that we would be invited to step in to taking that posture in our life with the people around us or where those hard issues are playing out, uh, that, that we would choose to take that position. Um, 
And, and maybe some of you here, you're at a point that's beyond just discouragement. Like you're just angry with God, or you've, you're uh, considering just dismissing the idea of God. Uh, we talked about somebody last week who was at that point that says, I just can't believe that God is good any longer. Um, maybe some bad stuff has happened in your life, and you feel like God's just been absent. He hasn't been speaking. He doesn't listen to you. If he cared, surely he would have done something by now. So forget it. If you're stepping out, I want to invite you back into what Habakkuk shows here of, of wrestling with God. Uh, find some people that you can share that with and, and not just leaving the faith, but saying, all right, Lord, I'm going to choose to come to you with respect and humility. Even if you're not sure he's there, if he is there, he would, de- he would uh, deserve humility and respect, right? So, so let's just go with the assumption, if he is there, he would deserve humility and respect. Let's give him that. And I think it, it does a lot for his ability to speak into our heart, for his ability to speak into our life, and it opens up our ears so that we can hear. Um, and that leads into our third point. When we protest, we should protest with our ears open. We should protest with our ears open again. Uh, you look at the current situation surrounding us, and there's a lot of talking, and it's hard to even have time to listen. You know, I think of these people who it's their job to talk on the television uh, or, or to bring the news. They don't even have time to listen. Th- their perspective probably isn't going to change because they don't have any time to just take in information. Uh, for believers, we would say just time to sit and pray and think and just be in the presence of God and allow Him to shape our minds and our hearts. It's just constant talking. And that's a temptation for, for many of us, I imagine, right? We want to get our view out there. We want to persuade people. We want to let them know what we think. We want to let them know where we stand. Um, there's a lot of scripture talks about listening. James 1 says we should be quick to listen, right? Slow to speak. Proverbs 17, 28 says even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's de- uh, determined intelligent. Proverbs 18, 2 says, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but they delight in airing their own opinions. So the fool will just, they just want to air out their own opinion. I'll tell you what I think, uh, but when it comes time to listen, it's much harder to do, to do that. And Habakkuk, he is airing his opinion here. He, he's expressing his heart. But remember, this comes after he has heard from God. It comes after he has gone to God and asked a bunch of questions. How long do I need to wait? Why aren't you intervening? Why are you sitting idly by? So he's asked his questions. He's put them on the table. He says, all right, now I'll listen. And he lets God speak. And here he is responding back. And the next chapter is going to be God's response. So it's true dialogue. And you'll see in the end, Habakkuk's allowing this dialogue to shape him and to transform him uh, as he journeys through this process. Um, Where's this at in the text? I I got this idea from chapter 2, verse 1. I think it's a a neat part of of this section. He, He ends this by saying, I'll take my stand at the watch post and I'll station myself on the tower. And I'll look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So he's made his case. He's spoken the injustice, what he, the way he perceives it, right? And he says, all right, I'm done. I'll close my mouth. Now I'm headed to the watchtower. And I'm going to wait and see what you have to say. And, and these, these watchtowers, most likely what's in, in mind here for Habakkuk is a tower set up outside the city that would have been strategically placed along some sort of pathway that uh, would allow people to see the enemy approaching. So they can be up in the watchtower, they got one eye on the enemy, and they got one eye on the people they love, and they can see when conflict is coming. And you can see Habakkuk saying, all right, I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to watch and see if the enemy just keeps coming. Or I'm going to watch and see if you start holding the enemy back. I'm going to see how this interaction, are you going to intervene, Lord, or is it just going to keep going? I'm going to go up, I'm going to watch, I'm going to listen. And while I'm up there, he doesn't say he's just listening. He's also thinking about his response. So as he's hearing information, it's informing how he's going to respond. It's saying, uh, you know, if depending on what he hears from God, that's going to affect what he says. At the end, he says, um, uh, eh, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So it's a time to listen, a time to think, 
and process and just be in the presence of God. And I think for us as believers, uh, there's little that is more important than that right now. Uh, that was my thought when coronavirus began. And now all this on top of it, it's like we just need to be in the presence of God in prayer and listening because there's so much noise. We don't know who to listen to. We don't know what the facts are. And, and we don't know where we fit into this. So we need to go to the watchtower and say, Lord, I'm waiting and I'm listening and I'm watching. And we expect that he's going to show up. Um, interesting to, to see the, you know, the, the prophets throughout Scripture. Uh, we think of prophets as, as great speakers, right? They had, they had great things to say. But the prophets were arguably also the greatest listeners. God gave them a great heart and a great mind to speak great things, but he also gave them amazing ears. You look at Moses, and it says that he went away and he stood to listen. He stood to watch right, as the, the presence of the Lord would go before him. Uh, you look at Elijah, he went away to the mountain. God told him to go away at the mountain, and he goes away, and it's just a time to listen. We see Jesus just go away to a solitary place because he just wanted to be with God. He did a lot of speaking, but he also did a lot of listening. Balaam, uh, he went away to see what God might reveal to him. All these prophets who were great uh, speakers, they had great things to say and to bring to the table. They were also great listeners who had the discipline and the ability to just step aside and say, all right, Lord, I'm here. I'm ready to listen. Um, and, and I think that's another thing that we can be invited into as we look at this. Uh, how are we listening? And who are we listening to? Uh, do we allow people to speak into our thoughts and the way we process things? Um, and, and how are we going to carve out the time to do that? Because it's not always easy. Um, so if you're here today and, and you're navigating some hard times, uh, I know this day we, we've kind of overflowed into some social issues. Um, last couple weeks maybe have been more personal for your own personal life. Um, but no matter what the issues are that you're facing, whether this, uh, the social injustice is on your mind or uh, something personal is on your mind, just want to invite you uh, to join Habakkuk going up in the watchtower and saying, Lord, I'm here to listen. And to invite you to, to say, Lord, I'm going to acknowledge you as the everlasting God who is holy and a rock. And, and even if you aren't there yet, if that is who God is. He deserves that respect, and I invite you to offer that to Him, and I think it will affect uh, your ability to have progress and your understanding of who God is. And maybe some of you, uh, you need a helper. You don't know what, what does it mean to listen for God? Uh, that's a foreign concept for some people. Uh, what does it mean to talk with God or, or to see where God is leading? What, like, practically speaking, what does that look like in day-to-day -day life? Uh, if, if you're thinking those sorts of thoughts, I encourage you, reach out to somebody uh, who's a believer, somebody in this church family. Uh, you can reach out to me. If I'm not the right person, find somebody that you can just share that with. Uh, I know in my personal life, the people around me have, have informed a lot of what God was trying to do or wanted to do. Uh, when I wasn't for sure, uh, before we went to, to Kentucky and, and to seminary, as I was talking about with my wife about that, uh, there were two or three people who just came up and spoke that into my life, and they didn't even know it was a conversation. Uh, when I was decided to, to go into ministry and, and be a lead pastor, uh, when I got married, I told my wife I'd never be a lead pastor. <laughs> no desire. Don't worry, honey. Not going to happen. Uh, that didn't start happening in my heart until 2014 when I was in Kentucky. When I went to seminary, I said, no way. It's not even in the cards. I was going there to be a discipleship pastor. And then people start speaking things into my life, and God had put that on my heart. Um, so a lot of times the people around us can speak into our life what God is trying to do. Uh, so it's helpful. You know, at, at this time, God spoke through the prophets in a powerful way, right? Uh, but Jesus has come. And he's been raised from the dead, and he poured out the Spirit upon all people. And he says, all men and women will have the Spirit of God inside of them who are a part of God's family. So now we have all these people as a resource who can hear from God, help us hear from God, and help discern next steps. I encourage you to just think of people in your life that may help with that. And today we get to share communion together. I think uh, communion is always timely, like there's always a, a good way for us to respond to God and, and maybe what he's putting on our life or, or on our mind. Um, so if there's hard things going on in your life right now, 
I encourage you to view this as a time to just lay it before the Lord and say, God, I don't know what's going on here. I don't understand it. I don't know what you're trying to do. I need some help, and I'm here to listen. Uh, one interesting thing with uh, Habakkuk, we didn't get into this today. Uh, we could have dug deep into it. It's its own message. Uh, one area that I think Habakkuk falls a little short, or he, he's not seen clearly, he's making this all about the enemy. He's saying, well, don't you see what they're doing? Don't you see how bad they are? They're like fishermen who are just reeling us in. And this is merciless killing. Why don't you bring judgment on them? See, he's making it about them. But what's the real issue? This is about Israel. This is about Judah. This is about you, Habakkuk. This isn't about them. Their day's coming. Their punishment's coming. And I think that's an important one and something God's put on my heart of everything that's happening right now. We want to point fingers and we want to say what's going on and we want to speak our thoughts about it. And God wants us maybe to have a time where we say, all right, I just need to take care of me. I don't need to worry about their wrong because maybe this isn't about them. Maybe it's about me and my sinfulness and my shortcomings and my failures because I deserve punishment just as much as anybody else aside from the grace of God, right? And that's true for all of us. We all deserve punishment aside from the grace of God. So communion is a great time to come forward, uh, you know, spiritually in your heart and just say, Lord, um, I'm not going to worry about everybody else. I'm going to worry about me right now. And I'm sorry for the ways that I've gone astray um, and have offended people. And we can do that with a sense of confidence. Uh, a verse I, I wrote down to share this morning, Hebrews 4, uh, 15 and 16. It says, for we do not have a high priest speaking about Jesus, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted just as we are, yet he was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that shows all sorts of things, right? One of the biggest things it shows is that Jesus suffered the greatest injustice the world has ever known. He was killed, and he was without sin. He went to the cross on our behalf and was without sin. And we have the opportunity uh, to come now and just uh, be grateful for that and also to know that because of that, we can go with a sense of confidence before God in all that we're doing. So uh, I'm going to invite the elders to come forward, anyone who's helping serve. Uh, if you're in the fellowship hall, the tent, um, the, there will be elders there, deacons there to help serve as well. We're going to bring the elements around. I think the worship team is going to come up and, and play as well. Um, if you're visiting with us, you're new to here, uh, you're new at Faith Alliance Church, you're watching online, uh, if you profess faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, you have a love for Him, you want to live for Him every day, we invite you to participate uh, in communion with us. Uh, maybe that's the, the first time you made that choice, you want to say, hey, uh, I want to trust God, I, I want to I have Him help me uh, navigate these hard times, uh, we invite you to join us in communion this morning. So as people are coming forward, I want to have just a, a moment of prayer, and I'll give you a, a minute just to kind of spend a reflection uh, in repentance, confession, uh, whatever you need in, in the presence of God. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we just come before you now as a, a family of believers here at Faith Alliance Church and uh, recognize um, our, our shortcomings um, that are probably happening on a daily basis. And I think, as you know, I realized this week and uh, in the, the life of Habakkuk in some ways, God, maybe um, we're doing wrong. We don't, e we don't even know the wrong we're doing sometimes. <laughs> we, think, we think we're in the right, but... Uh, yeah, I think uh, some, some days uh, we've probably deceived ourselves. So I, I pray, God, that 
that you would forgive us of wrongdoing, uh, forgive us of, of thoughts we've had that uh, aren't pleasing to you or uh, statements we've made. Um, God, forgive us for dismissing you and, and suggesting that uh, you're not good because uh, you haven't intervened in our life in the way that uh, we would have liked you to. Um, God, just help us to grow a, a sense of trust and faith, a uh, sense of humility and respect for who you are. And uh, God, I, I pray that we could know your joy in the midst of that. Um, God, as, as we get a taste of your grace and your goodness and uh, scripture says it, it's your kindness that leads to repentance, and we see uh, your tireless pursuit of the people you love. And God, we are grateful for that this morning, uh, that you pursue us. Um, you leave the 99 uh, just to go and get the one. And uh, for each one of us here, God, at, at uh, differing times, the one has certainly been us. And uh, so, Lord, I pray that uh, you would just forgive us um, for the times we go astray, uh, just like sheep do. And um, Lord, we're grateful to be counted as a part of your family and uh, to know your goodness. We do proclaim that you are the everlasting God who is holy and you are our rock. And uh, we depend on you in this time uh, more than ever. Uh, so just continue to be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, the, uh, the elders and deacons will come around and, and they'll hand out the elements and uh, after everybody has received, then we'll, we'll take the elements together. So you can just hold on to your cup as it comes around.
Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, cause your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. And your name, it cannot be overcome. And your name is a light that's forever lifted high. And your name, it cannot be overcome. Jesus, Jesus. Each location has uh, their drink and the bread, and uh, just want to invite you into something I, I've been looking at in this text. I share it with the staff this week. I think it's chapter one, verse five. Uh, God says, "Behold, I'm doing a work in your day that, if told, you would not believe. Uh, doing a work that you would not believe, even if told." Um, and, and I wonder, is is that the Babylonians coming to attack him, or is he looking forward to the coming of Christ? and the salvation of all people, um, because really we're going to get to some strategic verses in this text uh, that talk about God and His temple, and He's working for the salvation of His people. And I think uh, a pretty good case can be made there. The work He's talking about that people would have not have believed is that uh, there was a Savior coming who was going to destroy all evil for all time. And that's the good news uh, that we gather around uh, in the church is that a Savior has come. And, uh, you know, people, the skeptics of the faith, which we've talked a little more about in this, in this text than others, uh, they say, how come God's so evil in the Old Testament, but in the New, He's so good? And you look at the New Testament, read the book of Revelation, and Jesus is coming uh, to, to destroy all evil. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a time of judgment. Um, so we are the people who are safe from that, uh, in the shelter of the Most High, and He is our rock, and He is our God and our Lord, uh, and we get to cling to that in times like this and proclaim to the watching world uh, that God is good, uh, and He is working something uh, for the good of every person who loves Him. So let's uh, bring people into that family so they may know His hope and His joy and His peace uh, if you believe that Jesus accomplished all of that uh, for you, the greatest injustice, that he bared those burdens for you and he set you free uh, from the consequence of sin, from the coming judgment, and you have the joy of Christ in your heart, uh, I invite you this morning to share uh, in the eating of the bread and the drinking of the juice as we remember his body and his blood uh, that was shed for us. So as you're able, just take the bread and eat. And as you're able, uh, take the drink and drink with joy in your hearts and be thankful for all that Jesus has done. And would you pray with me as we close this morning? Father God, uh, we thank you for uh, the work that you are doing in this world. And we know that uh, that means for a time we may have to, to bear some burdens uh, but we also know that, that that's no surprise to you, and it's actually what the Word lays out, that uh, your patience means salvation. We'll see later in the book of Habakkuk, you're working for the salvation of your people, and uh, you're right there in your temple. Uh, you're not worried. You're not concerned. Uh, you can act in any moment, any instant. Uh, you, you can act, and uh, so we take comfort in that. Um, we're grateful, God, that 
uh, we are on, on your side and that we know you and have a hope in you. Uh, we do pray for this broken world, God, um, that, that you would just help us to be people who shine light into dark places, who speak truth with grace. Uh, so go before us this week, we pray. Uh, keep us safe uh, physically, emotionally, uh, spiritually, uh, until we gather again uh, for the glory of Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen. All right, well, um, you can come forward for prayer. Uh, we do that every week. If you have something you want to talk about or pray about, you're invited forward. I would ask again, we just give a little bit of time for the blue section to sneak out of here if they would like to. So maybe just pause for a moment uh, in the fellowship hall in the back here and let anybody who wants to sneak out get going. Uh, but have a great week. Enjoy the beautiful day.